good afternoon brothers and sisters i hope everyone here is most happy to be in this holy city the oldest city in the world varanasi well to begin with uh very honored and respected international president tim boyd international vice president mrs deepa padi international secretary maria arthama international treasurer nancy secret indian section president mr pradeep goyal treasurer p narayanan brothers and sisters today we have a holy person here on the dais and i am happy to announce first that today is his birthday so big big hands and say venerable rolande anand happy new year and also wish you happy birthday well rolande anand was born in amsterdam the netherlands he studied economic sociology at the university of amsterdam then he went to sri lanka and was ordained there in 1975 1975 seems to be a turning point of the many great souls afterwards he practiced meditation and received higher ordination in 1977 in sri lanka in sri lanka actually sri lanka has become his homeland now he has conducted numerous teachings and retreats in various countries like germany sri lanka india bali japan pakistan france england he has also conducted vipassana meditation and they call them as vipassana meditation retreats in south africa besides his all activities of this especially the he has conducted meditation seminars in himalaya indonesia holland australia and he is a member in ineb international network of engaged buddhist international network of engaged buddhist he is also a member in network of western buddhist teachers conference and he is also a member in board of mandala project of tibetan house in new delhi regarding his visits he is not new to adyar he has been visiting adyar on and often because sri lanka is nearer to chennai so regarding his visit to adyar he has conducted two times school of wisdom sessions there in adyar and has given lectures in many international conventions and even now immediately after this he is going to conduct a school of wisdom at adyar those who wish to attend they are warmly welcome i am also grateful to rather i am greatly obliged to international secretary to give me this opportunity to introduce today's speaker 
फेनरेबल ओलांडे आनंद हु इज ग्रेटली रेवर्ड इन श्रीलंका हुई चाय पर्सनली सॉ ड्यूरिंग माय विजिट टू श्रीलंका आई आल्सो वेलकम श्रीलंका फेडरेशन थियासोफिकल फेडरेशन प्रेसिडेंट ब्रदर दुमिंदो वानीगास्कर he is standing give him warm welcome with claps both of them orlando anand and dumendo and other brothers of the sri lanka theosophical federation they warmly welcomed to the pres president of the indo pacific federation brother Uh, Gerardo Brennan and myself both were we visited Sri Lanka and you all know last year in the month of April there was serial bomb blast on the 21st April and we reached there on 19th April we had a talk in the federation on 20th but on 21st there was a serial bomb blast and we were much scared actually these two members and other members they were very supportive kind enough to give us all kinds of hospitality and protection and also they showed a very nice hospitality to show the sri lanka so in this sense maria i am telling i am really obliged to give me this opportunity to introduce today's speaker who is very venerable and uh, very well known in sri lanka Uh, with this short introduction we are very eager to listen our today's speaker so i call upon venerable orlando anand to give his speak on the topic mindfulness or a mind full of things see the topic itself suggest many things mindfulness or a mind full of things in fact with your permission i tell the human mind is really a full of things as it is said by krishna murti human mind is conditioned it is full of things and to be aware of these full of things is itself being a mindfulness i hope you will enlighten us on this topic in this warm evening mr orland thank you maybe you can switch switch off <clears throat> good afternoon everyone brothers and sisters as uh, professor shinde um introduced me with a little bit of exaggeration as a very venerable a uh, person but uh, that is a spelling mistake on my uh, personal card it should be the most vulnerable uh, on the other <laughs> so anyway the topic for today is um mindfulness or a mindful of things and actually professor shinde just summed up my talk <laughs> in a few sentences <laughs> because um most people including myself i suppose are having a lot of thoughts in their minds about the past and the so called future which actually have nothing to do with the reality here and now we tend to um go back in time thinking about the past not in a productive way like what you really need to know about the past which krishna murti used to call the technical past which you need but rather we dwell in the psychological past where we think like uh, he did this to me she she said that to me i could have done this i shouldn't have done that or things like that and we dwell on that and have remorse and um, pain and pleasure sometimes about thinking about the past 
And then a lot of people, it seems that um, people in general, there was a survey done by the BBC about this topic, how much time people spend actually on uh, thinking about the past and the future. And it turned out that um, about 75% of our time we spend on thinking about the past and or the future. So with uh, Krishnamurti's uh, very helpful um, definition of uh, past and future and dividing it into the technical past and the technical future and the psychological past and the psychological future. Technical past and future are no problem. You need them. You need to think about uh, things like uh, what you know already and uh, you have to have the knowledge of your, um, let's say, your um, job and uh, road going back home, although nowadays people just put, uh, what is it called, the uh, Google Maps and they get there automatically. But a lot of things we have to know, that is no problem. But when we are dwelling in the past, as I just mentioned, then it becomes a burden, psychological burden. Similarly, if we are going to do anything in the future, planning to do anything in the future, then we need to think about it and uh, use our brains for purpose of achieving that goal. But if we're starting to think, what am I going to do and how am I going to do it? What might people think about me or about what I'm going to do? Then it becomes a psychological planning, which is uh, also a kind of a burden. So if we spend 75% of our time on that, that means there's only 25% left for being in the here and now. So if we can shed those uh, memories of the past and the planning, which is based on hopes and fear basically about the future, then <coughs> we free a lot of memory, so to speak, to function more efficiently in the present moment. So that is um, done, on, uh, among other things, by being aware, being mindful. So I, by now I'm sure that all of you who know English know the difference between mindfulness and a mind full of things. So mindfulness could be also defined as um, <coughs> awareness or attention. It is not thinking about things, but being aware of, in the present moment, of, well, there are different kinds of awarenesses, and I'm going to fall back on Buddha's teachings on the development of mindfulness, which he taught us in the Satipatthana Sutta, that is the teaching on the development of mindfulness. And he distinguished um, four types of foundations onto which we can uh, turn our mindfulness. The awareness of the body, awareness of feelings, awareness of the mind, and awareness of the characteristics of mind and matter. Those I will try to explain a little bit uh, more uh, in detail. When the Buddha says, be aware of your body, you can become aware of the body, for instance, that you are sitting here, or that you are standing, or that you are walking, or that you are lying down, or whether you are uh, cooking, or cleaning, or bunga jumping, or whatever you may be doing, be aware of the body, what it is doing and also the awareness of the breath is one of the things that belongs to the body and is mentioned very much as a meditation object to be aware of that is called anapanasati bhavana the development of the mind on the feeling of the breath and there are different schools let's say uh, that teach it in different ways one school says be aware of the breath here inside your nostrils. Another school, which was a Burmese school, said 
be aware of the rising and falling of your abdomen as you're breathing in, the abdomen rises. When you are breathing out, the abdomen falls. When you're aware of that and you focus your attention, you can become more and more aware of the body in that subtle aspect, namely of the breath. And if you can manage to become more and more and more aware of that chosen object, then perhaps you can get what is called deeply concentrated on that object and you may attain what is called dhyanas or jhana or deep concentration or absorption. And you may even attain certain types of um, what is called psychic powers. Psychic powers such as clairvoyance, clairaudience, reading other people's minds, remembering previous lives, or um, appearing in different places. But um, when we say that is very, let's say, um, it gives you a peace. It gives you peace of mind to concentrate on such a subtle object. Then the words of Krishnamurti once again come to my mind. He says, "That is not real peace of mind. That is just a peace of the mind." If you notice the difference, anybody didn't notice the difference? I will repeat it now. <laughs> That is not real peace of mind with EA. That is just a peace of the mind with IE. So, never mind, it doesn't matter. But still, it does matter um, because if one thinks that meditation is only uh, the ability to focus on one chosen object and exclude all other objects and get deeply into that particular chosen object, then one could be very much uh, disappointed if one doesn't practice in a very suitable environment for many, many days or weeks or months, but just maybe half an hour at a time. I'm sure, almost sure, that most people will not be able to get that concentration which they are expecting. They say, oh, I can't concentrate. My mind is full of thoughts, my mind goes all over the place and um, I cannot concentrate, therefore I cannot meditate and they give up meditation altogether. But there is another way. One doesn't have to concentrate just on one object only. There are these four foundations of mindfulness which is called Chatur Satipatthana in the Buddha's words, the four foundations of mindfulness namely body, feelings, mind, and mind objects. So there's plenty to choose from. You don't really have to choose because these objects will come to your consciousness by themselves. If you start choosing, then you may have a problem, you see? So if you try to choose and you try to stay with that particular object, then you find you can't. And then you say, I can't concentrate and therefore I can't meditate, and then again you give up. But if you are able to uh, be aware from moment to moment without choosing, and I suppose, I hope I'm not breaking any what you call uh, copyright here, but um, J. Krishnamurti used to call it choiceless awareness, to be aware of these different objects from moment to moment without trying to choose for this or for that, but just to be aware of what is. And to be aware of what is from moment to moment will give us more clarity, more understanding, and more peace of mind also, because there is no conflict between what is and what you want it to be. That is the main problem, probably, that if we want something, then there is a kind of an ego that wants something and as there is an ego, a self, me, wanting something, you create a kind of a circle around yourself. Ego, where there is an ego, there must be a circle. Where there is a circle or a circumference, there will be the inner and the outer. 
And if the inner is something different from the outer, then there's a conflict between the inner and the outer, and then there's a frustration and a conflict, and therefore there is some kind of suffering and dissatisfaction about it, and then that is actually a problem of the ego. But in uh, what is called choiceless awareness, there is not really an ego that chooses to have something uh, different from what is. So in that sense, the moment-to-moment -moment mindfulness, which is actually the practice of uh, vipassana meditation, uh, is a way of learning to see the things as they really are. Mostly, uh, sorry, mm, mostly people do not see the things as they really are. What does that mean? Well, um, we do not um, we do not accept the fact that things are changing. We may intellectually realize it and say yes, 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 everything is changing, but when it comes to um, do you really accept it? Well, maybe not. When the wrinkles come to our face and the hair becomes gray and the teeth are falling out <laughs> and things like that and you don't get what you want, then it becomes a problem. So um, then we do not really accept the changes. We project some kind of permanency onto impermanent things. Everything is impermanent. The Buddha says, Sabbe Sankara Anicca. All conditioned things are impermanent. But we like to make things more permanent than they really are. So that is good for the, um, what you call it, um, the beauty manufacturers of creams and uh, other kind of uh, things to make us look younger than we really are. It's a multi-billion dollar uh, industry. <laughs> so, but it is based on a kind of delusion, an illusion that we can be younger than we really are. And um, we also project some kind of an idea onto the world that it can really give us full satisfaction, can make us really happy. Well, uh, so that's why we look for happiness by going to uh, concerts, listen to beautiful music, and then uh, maybe see beautiful things, go on journeys, and then we go out to eat in nice restaurants to have some nice taste and smells, perfumes, and uh, all kinds of things, nice feelings, but after a little while we get bored with that and we might say, is that all there is? Then we find it is right, quite empty. Those pleasant feelings, they change again into their opposite. Therefore, the Buddha said, all conditioned things are really unsatisfactory. In the old days, they used to say, suffering for the word dukkha, which the doctor today from Argentina was using the word doc dukkha. Well, um, dukkha is a Pali and Sanskrit word which means more than just suffering. It means unsatisfactoriness. You cannot always get what you want, but you get what you need. That is the law of karma, I suppose, in modern terminology. But um, Dukkha is one of the truths of existence. So, but we, as um, unenlightened people, don't see it <coughs> as such. So we're always looking for happiness in the external world, but we can't really find it. And then finally, one day, maybe we wake up and say, we, we realize that the real happiness is not outside oneself, but is basically already within you. You were looking for it far away, but then you find it is basically already there, but covered up with thoughts and emotions. A lot of thoughts, a lot of emotions, they blur the beautiful, peaceful happiness that is already within our mind. Sometimes in Mahayana Buddhism they call that the Buddha mind, your basic 
uh, unconditioned shining mind in Theravada Buddhism, we call it like that. So um, the thing is that um, the third characteristic that one learns in this observation of the body, the feelings and the mind is that uh, there is nothing really, according to Buddhism I'm saying now, that there's nothing really which I can call myself or me, mine or my own. If there would be a thing that I could call me, mine, myself or my own, I should be able to keep it exactly the way that I want. But nobody has been able to do that yet. So that's why we call the Buddha an anatta vadi, somebody who preaches anatman. Whereas Theravada and also in um, Hinduism is Atman Vadi. Atma. Atma is the real thing and that is your real self, that is your real me. This small thing is not the real one. Jiva Atman is one thing, but the Paramatman is the real. But the Buddha has another thing which he calls the unconditioned. There is, everything is conditioned under the sun, like whatever is made up of uh, elements, and of color and shape and uh, taste, etc. That is called the condition. But there is one thing that is unconditioned, the Buddha says, that is nirvana. Nirvana is not me, mine, myself or my soul. But if there would be no nirvana, there would be no possibility to get out of the circle of birth and death and rebirth. As long as we are not enlightened, we will be reborn again and again and again. And uh, because there is this nirvana, we have the possibility to escape from that cycle of birth, death and rebirth, which is automatically some kind of form of unsatisfactoriness. Now here we have to maybe add something um, that there are different views on this in Theravada Buddhism and in Mahayana Buddhism. I'm just talking about Buddhism, not about other religions, but uh, let's say in Theravada Buddhism one believes that once you become an Arahat, as a follower of the Buddha, then there is no more rebirth in any plane of existence, neither the human plane or the Deva realm or the Brahma realm or any other realms. And uh, the Buddha has attained that kind of status on his own. That's why he was called a Samma Sambuddha. But then in Mahayana Buddhism, which is practiced in the northern countries like China, Japan, Korea, Vietnam, and also in um, Tibet and in uh, Bhutan and in Mongolia, for instance, those um, countries, they have the Bodhisattva ideal and they say, even if you have attained that higher state of uh, liberation, that you can actually get out of that circle of rebirth, still, out of compassion for the suffering of others, you choose to be reborn. Not because you like samsara so much, but because you think this is a higher aim, who can attain a higher aim than to suffer, than to, um, uh, how do you say, to, uh, to remove the suffering of people who are suffering. So, in that sense, there are different ideas. That's why they say in Theravada, the ideal is to become an Arahat. In Mahayana Buddhism, the ideal is to be a Bodhisattva and choose to be reborn again and again, so you can help others to attain liberation from uh, suffering. Not that the Theravadins are all selfish people because you cannot attain liberation by being selfish. And I think there are also examples, quite a few, of uh, learned and monks who have attained certain stages of enlightenment who later on in life decided to be a bodhisattva um, and uh, not to just opt for opting out of samsara. I actually once asked from one of the most respected, learned and uh, 
realized uh, monks in Sri Lanka, Balangode Ananamaitri, Dumindamatya, you know, uh, that monk, he had already attained certain stages of enlightenment, and he knew a lot of things also about all of religion. I think he was a member of the TS as well. And um, then in later on in life he decided and he declared that he is following the path of the Bodhisattva. So in Sri Lanka we believe that if you have attained at even the first stage of enlightenment, then there is no way back. You will automatically, maximum seven lifetimes, you will be enlightened and not be reborn anywhere. So I asked him, I didn't say you venerable, but is it possible for a person who has attained such and such a stage to still choose to become a um, bodhisattva? Because isn't it, you know, in Sri Lanka we believe that maximum seven lifetimes and that's not enough for being a bodhisattva. Bodhisattva needs many, many more lifetimes. Like the Buddha himself in his previous lives, 550 Jataka stories, hundreds of thousands of rebirths, and uh, so on. He says, yes, but that is what the people in Sri Lanka believe. So he kept it open that there's a possibility. So anyway, um, this mindfulness, which is called sati in Pali and smurti in uh, Sanskrit, meaning awareness, is leading to what is called vipassana or insight. Now insight is a kind of uh, knowledge, not the accumulated knowledge from uh, books or learning, but um, kind of direct perception of the, what we just mentioned, those characteristics of change, unsatisfactoriness, and um, what is called non-self. If one gets that insight, then it helps us to uproot what is called um, greed, hatred, and delusion. Lobha, dvesha, and moha. Those three are the main things which keep us going in that round of rebirth. As long as we have plenty of uh, greed and uh, hatred and je jealousy and uh, ignorance, the, then we will be circling around and having to suffer the consequences of our own karma again and again and again. So the um, different types of mindfulnesses that are mentioned in these four um, foundations is the body, as I mentioned, whether you are standing or sitting or walking or lying down or doing whatever, you can translate it into daily life activities also. And um, then, uh, you know, some people don't seem to know whether they are going or coming, coming or going. So that is, we have to bring our attention to the body by what Krishnamurti again meant is bundling your energies, not to have it scattered all over the place, but to bundle your energies into the present moment. The one thing is to be aware of the body, then mindfulness of feeling. Now feeling in English often de um, depicts um, a kind of mental feeling or an emotion. And when we say another kind of feeling could be just uh, the uh, tactile feeling, that is sensations. So we have pleasant sensations, unpleasant sensations, neutral sensations. We have mental uh, feelings, pleasant and unpleasant and neutral, that we can s be aware of. And if you're aware of them, well, with mindfulness training, we can be aware of those states of mind, you can say, or feelings, um, without reacting to them with likes or dislikes. That is one of the more important things in the practice of mindfulness, not to add likes and dislikes. Usually that comes after the experience, you know. At the moment, each moment of consciousness, we can say, has a content like seeing or hearing, smelling or tasting, whatever, or thinking. 
and then there is immediately with that a feeling that arises with it and there is something which is watching like the observer the observer in the same moment but when we say we are thinking about something that comes after that comes after that moment and therefore uh, thinking is not the same as mindfulness that leads to a mind full of things thinking light leads to a mind full of things whereas mindfulness tends to empty the mind of unnecessary additions so if we are able to just observe those feelings and realize this is a feeling it's just feeling 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 there are techniques which if you like techniques maybe you don't like techniques but they do teach these kind of things that we label the experience like when there's a feeling and it persists you become aware of it then you may label it as feeling 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 or thinking is going on and you become aware of it and then you can label it as thinking 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 when you don't need these thoughts you know of course some thoughts we do need but a lot of the thoughts which come to our mind we don't really need so if it is an unnecessary thought which I would say during the meditation maybe 98.5 percent are unnecessary thoughts we can deal with them by labeling them as thinking 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 and then you see when you really become aware of it it sort of disappears so it drops then the um, mindfulness of the mind itself that is a little bit more subtle and a little bit more difficult to be aware of your mind what is the mind doing well thinking is one of the things in the mind that is going on but there may be also different kinds of states of mind for instance you may be uh, agitated or you may notice that you are calm and quiet or you maybe you are distracted those kind of things also can be part of the uh, objects that we can be aware of so when we um, put our attention to all that then we become more and more aware of what is actually happening in body and uh, mind now this um, mindfulness of the characteristics of body and mind I have already mentioned quite extensively and they are called anicca dukkha and anatta in Pali language or how do you say change unsatisfactoriness and non-self and the non-self is a little bit difficult to understand and some people um, misunderstand that notion also what does it mean non-self and uh, in Sri Lanka and all the Theravada countries I don't know if you know where the Theravada Buddhism is practiced Sri Lanka Burma Thailand Laos and Cambodia are the Theravada countries where they all believe in non-self in Mahayana countries they also should be believing in non-self but they have a slightly different uh, connotation anyway those believing in non-self they say in Buddhism we have no self and they're very proud of it you know so, <laughs> so they had this selfishness you know, about the non-self nature so I think that is a lack of understanding and realization I suppose that is just like the thing when we are just repeating the knowledge and not have the realization then you get those kind of uh, what is called misunderstandings also now nowadays uh, mindfulness is also a multi I don't know billion or have they reached the trillion mark no uh, I think multi-million dollar business uh, mindfulness based stress reduction therapy I don't know whether you are familiar with the name of uh, Dr. John Kabat-Zinn who was the founder of this particular therapy he was in the School of Medicine in Harvard University I think and um, he has taken these teachings of the Buddha and applied it to 
the overcoming of stress, like post-stress, um, what is it called, uh, ph phenomena, and um, the uh, stress that people are going through, and patients who were treated by doctors in different kind of specialties and who could not be helped anymore. They came to John kabat and he sort of sorted them out and uh, gave a very simple technique to de-stress using this method of mindfulness of body, feelings and mind and um, mind also, mind objects and in a very simple way. And then um, sometimes the bill comes to $5,000 per um, uh, course, uh, you know. But anyway, he became very famous and it spread like anything, like wildfire. And now mindfulness-based stress reduction therapy has become a household name. And mindfulness is all over the place. And um, nowadays there is yet another branch, I could say, or something new. I had never, never heard of it, but recently somebody said, haven't you heard of heartfulness? There is a new uh, movement called heartfulness. And then I asked from a person in the Theosophical Society in Sri Lanka, who was a representative of that movement, what is the difference between mindfulness and heartfulness? He said, it's the same thing. Oh, so why do you want to call it by a different name? Well, the heart has more to do, to do with empathy and mindfulness has more to do with the head, it seems. So, the head and the heart. I said, yes, but in Chinese, the word for mind is the same for heart and mind is xin. So, uh, yes, uh, there are some Chinese speakers here. Uh, so, uh, anyway, um, mind and heart go together and uh, mindfulness is not as I said earlier, thinking about, but being aware. And where the awareness is exactly, even where the mind is exactly, still we haven't found out. I think the, the specialists also don't know exactly where the mind is situated. But um, that it can be used and that one can be mindful rather than filling the mind, that is also being explored and that mindfulness can be very much useful for the, well, conflict resolution within oneself and even between people. They also use mindfulness in um, relationships. And um, also nowadays, just the other day, I saw that in England there are some schools which have introduced mindfulness even in the primary schools. They start the day with mindfulness. Here in India also, Vasanta school, they have meditation in the morning during their 8 o'clock assembly. And of course in India, um, you know, meditation has been practiced for ages. But in the West, still relatively new, since the 70s it's come up. And nowadays it's just a household word. Mindfulness has become very popular, meditation. TM, all kinds of things. But mindfulness, um, you know, another mindfulness teacher, famous one, is S.N. Goenka, Satya Narayana Goenka. So Goenka, uh, who was, uh, I think, born in Burma, lived in Burma, but of an Indian family, from Bombay, actually, from very rich family. Huh? Amnabad, okay. So, um, Goenka uh, was a businessman in Burma, very rich one, successful businessman, but he had a terrible headache, migraine, all the time. And he went to look for solace uh, by visiting headache centers all over the world, Japan, America, Germany, Switzerland, and he couldn't get rid of his headache until somebody told him, why don't you try a 10-day Vipassana course by uh, so-and-so that is, um, at the moment I forget the name of his teacher in Burma, who was a government uh, servant, and um, then he tried it out, 
and after 10 days he had no more headache. It was a pretty tough course. First he thought that he would jump over the wall to get out of it because it was so painful, but he sat through it and then he found out that his headache was gone. And he stayed on for nine and a half or ten years with the same teacher. And um, then the teacher said, now you should go and teach it to your friends and relatives in India. So about in the 1970s, Goenka started the first uh, center, Vipassana center in Igatpuri near Nasik. And then um, one after the other center was started. Now we have three or four centers in Sri Lanka alone and about 150 Goenka Vipassana centers around the world. But the thing is, they're all the same. 10 day courses and they have recorded all the talks which were given by Goenka in the evenings. He is no more, he passed away. But his talks are always there and they haven't changed a comma. So um, it is always exactly the same teachings and some people say, I've already uh, done two retreats with Goenka, you see. Then the other one says, oh, that's nothing. I've done seven or eight or ten, you know. So it's a little bit like um, um, boosting the ego, I suppose, rather than overcoming the ego. But anyway, he became very famous. And the teachings there are part of the four noble, for the four, um, uh, how do you call it, uh, foundations of mindfulness. Namely, the first three days of the 10-day course, they spend on watching the breath inside the nose. So that is done about 10 hours per day. It's not like half an hour in the morning, half an hour in the evening, but 10 hours per day. Try to bring your attention to that subtle object. And then some people get it on the first day, some people on the second, some on the third, and some don't get it at all. But once that feeling of concentration on a subtle object is there, some people say, wow, is that what means, what is meant by one-pointedness or concentration? It becomes like a revelation to some people and it changes their life. But one can do without that also. Anyway, on the, what they call the evening of the third day, they call it day four, they start uh, observing the feelings, the sensations in the body from the very top of the head, going down one side, going up that side, to the other side, slowly, slowly. They take about one and a half hours to feel those sensations on the surface of the skin of the whole body. And they, they realize that there are sensations. Yes, quiet, it's okay then. So, um, <laughs> they, they actually um, find out that the whole body has sensations. And they also see that these sensations are not permanent. They're just coming and going, and these sensations are not really me, mine, or myself. They're just sensations. And so they are actually observing what is called Vedana, or sensations. So it's actually part of Vipassana. They call it Vipassana. Day four is Vipassana until the day 10, but we would really say it is Vedana Nusati or the, um, the practice of mindfulness on feeling or sensation. And later on, in the next uh, extended courses of Goenka, they actually go on to the observance of the mind and the mind objects. Then it becomes a full-fledged Vipassana meditation course. But the first 10 days, the 10 day courses are, I would say, what is called full proof. Everybody can do it. Some people like it very much and they really get into it. And some people get put off for the rest of their life. It's too much because it's very strict. So anyway, um, in um, the practice of mindfulness as a spiritual practice, it actually is to overcome suffering and to attain nirvana. In short, that is why we do this kind of meditation. There are a lot of, many types of meditation. If you look around, 
know, Zen meditation, Tibetan meditation, the Hindu meditation, um, TM, then all kinds of Kriya Yoga, all kinds of meditations. In Buddhist meditation also there are so many types. But generally speaking there are only two types. One is what is called um, the, mm, in Pali language we call it Samatha Bhavana, tranquility meditation. Any kind of technique that leads you to tranquility of mind. Tranquility of mind means that you feel peaceful by doing some kind of uh, technique. So maybe it could be re you know, using a mantra or using tratak, like concentration on a particular object, or it could be breathing, or it could be anything which helps you to become peaceful. Maybe using music also nowadays, music type of uh, meditation. And um, I just thought of the first sentence in the Eightfold um, Ashtangika Yoga of uh, Yoga Sutra of Patanjali, which says, um, Chitta Vritti Nirodha Yogaha, right? So uh, when the Chitta Vritti or the thought mm, ups and downs, uh, vibrations of the thoughts come to a standstill, that is real yoga. Then you are united. But still, I don't know, it depends on what kind of technique leads to that state, I suppose. Because if it is just a suppression of thoughts by some other kind of technique, then it is like trying to hold a football down underwater, and when you take your hand off, the ball bounces back. Whereas if you can do what is called insight meditation and uproot greed, hatred and delusion especially, then it becomes peaceful without conflict and then there is clarity and happiness and peace within which is not really uh, disturbed. The other tranquility meditation really depends on if you're doing that technique, it is quiet, but as soon as you stop, it is back to square one in a way. So that is just a kind of, uh, yeah. So in um, the Buddhist literature we find that the vipassana meditation or the practice of satipatthana, mindfulness meditation, is called the ekayano maggo. That means one way. And some people who claim it to be the one and only way which I think is a little bit too exclusive because there may be many ways. But anyway, ekayano mago is the Pali word for one way. And uh, they say that is the way to attain nirvana. So basically, we have been talking and talking, and, or I have been talking about uh, <coughs> meditation and mindfulness. And now maybe you're uh, heads may be full of uh, thoughts and impressions. So how about um, sitting quietly together for a few minutes and then I will uh, end with a short chant and a kind of a blessing in the Pali language. Let us sit quietly. Just relaxing the body and mind.
blessings come. Bhavatu Sabamangram. May the invisible helpers, Devas, protect us. Rakhantu Sabdevata. By the power of all enlightened ones, Sabbuddhanu Bhavena. By the power of all truth, Sambhadhammanu Bhavena. By the power of the spiritual community, Sambhasanghanu Bhavena. May the highest happiness, Paramang Sukhang, the deepest peace, Paramashan. The greatest security, Sada Sati, ever be yours. Bhavatu Sambhamangalang, Rakhantu Sambhadivata, Sambhabuddhanu Bhavena, Sada Sati Bhavantu Te. Bhavatu Sambhamangalam Rakhantu Sambhadevata Sambhadhammanu Bhavena Sarasati Bhavantu Te Bhavatu Sambhamangalam Rakhantu Sambhadevata Sambha Sanghanu Bhavena Sada Sati Bhavantuti Thank you on behalf of International Theosophical Society as well as Indian section for your valuable guidance for having this technique of mindfulness to make our mind not only open but also active and peaceful. So if you develop that technique, what guidance he has given that leads you to experience the peace of mind. Otherwise, he also mentioned in the beginning that if there is mindfulness, there is peace of mind. If there is no mindfulness, if it is full of things, then their mind will go into pieces. So I hope you are very much thankful for your valuable guidance for this technique of mindfulness meditation. Thank you very much. The session is over. I know.